Hi, I'm Corey Stern of the Daily Pennsylvanian, here with Jeffrey Garrett, Dean of the Warden School, to talk about his first 100 days in office. What's a day look like? Um, I, uh, I tend to have long days at the moment, so my day started, I had a meeting um, with one of our staff pre-breakfast at 7.30, and at the end of the day, I'm going to help introduce some of the new faculty members at Wharton to the university community at President Gutman's house. Now I live in Centre City, uh, which is fantastic because within 10 minutes walk I can do, my wife and I can do almost anything we like and I can also walk to work in 20 minutes, which is a great thing unless it's too sweaty or too cold and I haven't encountered either yet. Well, I'm, you know, look, I'm not an expert on social media, but I understand that uh, it's the most important communication channel, the most important emerging communication channel we've got. And, you know, I get to lead uh, an unbelievably blessed life that I hope is also reasonably interesting. So if I can be in New York or San Francisco or Beijing and, and talk about it a little bit, and particularly if I can give it some real local flavor of the day, I, I, hope, that's, uh, I hope that's of interest to people who are interested in and supportive of the Warden School. Yeah, you know, I was at a, an undergraduate student event last night and uh, a couple of students wanted to do selfies of me, so I asked them to text the photos to me so I could tweet, but before I got a chance to do it, a couple of them had tweeted themselves, and so, yeah, it was great in the room, but I hope the, the, in, the in the room then uh, radiates out through social media. Let me just hit a couple of things that are that are probably uh, of interest to the to the DP audience. The first one is um, where Wharton actually looks like Australian universities, but is so unusual in the U.S., which is the the size and quality of the undergraduate program. As you know, most leading American business schools, and it's true for European ones as well, are, are basically MBA only. You know, the fact that we've got here the world-leading undergraduate program, I think, is an incredible asset and something that really makes Wharton distinctive in the business school world. Um, the, the biggest difference between here and Australia, and in fact here and a lot of the rest of the world now in business education, is that we have a thriving full-time MBA program, you know, with about 1,700 students in residence. The opportunity costs for somebody who's 28 and in a career and maybe starting a family to be a full-time student, uh, the, those opportunity costs are really high. And therefore, I think that means two things. One, the value proposition we've got to offer to our MBA students has got to be absolutely rock solid and crystal clear. But second, I see now from the MBA students that they jump into their life with both feet because they're making such a big commitment they want to get the most they can out of their time here. Well, look, being, being the dean of uh, one of the best, if not the best, business school in the world is not a bad gig for anybody. And, you know, I used to say, and it was true, that in Australia, uh, being the dean of the Australian School of Business was probably the best job in Australia for me. This is probably the best job in the world for me. So uh, I'm just so lucky uh, that, uh, that President Gutman and others at the university wanted me to be in the job. And, and all I have to do now is make sure that uh, I do a good job while I'm here. You know, it's, it's so interesting, you know, I've, I've been around a bit and I think now uh, I see that uh, my perspectives, uh, perspectives on the U.S., on business education, from being outside the country, live, basically I've lived half my life in the U.S. and half my life in Australia and the rest of the world. Uh, I, I think the, the perspective matters and, you know, I, I see pretty clearly today two things, one thing about the US and one thing about the business world that maybe I wouldn't have if I was, if I'd just been sitting in, in US higher education continuously. So the first thing is that the thing that's made the US distinctive probably for a hundred years and I think will keep powering the US in the 21st century is a combination of immigration and innovation. 
So the US is an immigration magnet, and I think the reason for that is it's an innovation engine. So I hope that I and other people who've come to this country actually contribute to that, but we've certainly been drawn to the US because of the dynamism of the country, right? If, if, if you think you want to make a difference and you've got some ability to do that, you believe it'll be turbocharged in the US. So immigration and innovation, I think, is what's distinctive about the US. If I think about the 21st century, and again, looking at it from Australia, you know, the financial crisis in 2008 was a very big deal. Um, and I think it had, it, but I think when the history is written, the biggest consequence of that is going to be that we're probably in an era now of a rising mismatch between societal need and the capacity of government to meet that need. So what's that mean? It probably means that if we're going to solve a lot of big problems going forward, the private sector is going to play a bigger role, not a smaller role than it's played historically. So one way I'm thinking about that is we used to think that sort of private benefit and public good were very different. I think they're going to come much closer together in the next 10 or 20 years, and that's why I'm very excited to be here at the leading edge of business education. The first thing is uh, a bit of a glib one. You know, when you hear me talk, you probably think I don't sound like I'm American. When I'm in Australia, no one believes that I'm Australian. They all think I'm American. So. Being a sort of insider-outsider in two cultures is, you know, sometimes it's a bit challenging uh, in, a, in a psychological sense, but I think in terms of viewing the world, it, it's a great place to be. So, so two things there. One, it probably gives me perspective. Two, my accent is always a talking point, and I'm always interested in people's accents. And what I see about them now is that um, you only hear the bits that are a bit discordant, so, of course, you hear the Australian in my voice, but Australians hear the American in my voice, and, and, and maybe that's a metaphor for bigger things. But the, the third thing I wanted to say about that is that I've spent, when I was in the US, I spent a, a lot of time trying to understand and explain to Americans the rest of the world. In the past six years, until I came to Wharton, I was actually outside the US trying to explain America to Australians and to Asians. And, and I think that, that probably you know, having that balance does give me uh, a perspective which is a bit unusual. And, and the, the only last thing I'd say about that is I'm a, I'm a very macro person, not a micro person. So I look at the role of business, where it fits in, where it fits in economically, socially, how it affects geopolitics rather than sort of at the firm level. So I think that's a good complement with a traditional business school focus on you know, alpha in firms or alpha in, in, in investment offices. Well, I mean, it, 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 I'm, I'm uh, of course, uh, interested and actually flattered that someone would look so deeply into my, you know, into what's just been my life. Um, but, but obviously, part of that comes with the terrain, being the Dean of Wharton. You know, what I'd say about what I'd say about it actually is, you know, I'm I'm always on the glass half full side of the ledger, and for me, what I see is that I actually have a lot of perspectives now, both on the world and on how different kinds of universities operate that I think will allow me to do the job at Wharton better. You know, let me give you just one for instance of that uh, where things are going to play out very differently in different parts of the higher education sector. So everyone's concerned these days about online education, what's it going to do? When I was sitting in an Australian public university where cost pressures are incredible, I really had to think about online education as a way to, to cut the cost of the education that we were providing without eroding quality. If you flip that to Wharton, online education is a massive opportunity. One, we're the leading player in the MOOCs world, massive open online courses, and that's a brand projection opportunity for us that also allows us to provide low cost or free education to people around the world who can never be like you and come on campus. But I think equally we can learn an enormous amount from online that can help us improve the quality of on-campus education in at least two ways. One is online MOOCs are a big data opportunity. We learn an enormous amount about how students learn online and that can help us improve pedagogy on campus. Second, we can ensure, you know, the value of what we're doing in this room, the face-to-face -face communication is unbelievably high. The way we can maximize that value 
is to allow you to prepare for a class uh, on your cell phone at night at, at 2 a.m. Um, so that when you come to class, you and everyone else in the room, including your instructor, are on the same page and ready to go with the highest value add stuff. So online's a clear case where it's going to affect all of higher education. But it's going to, it, it, whereas it's a, clearly an opportunity for an elite institution like Wharton at Penn, in a lot of the rest of the world, it's a big threat to the, to the way that universities have run for a long time. How can you assure Wharton that you're in this more for a little bit more than the long run then? Well, you know, I'm a big believer in having the incentives aligned. And as I told you before, I think this is likely to be the best job in the world for me. So it's not something that I'd like to leave. And, uh, and uh, you know, the, the thing that I've seen very clearly here in my first three months is that this is a long game we're playing. It's not only my deanship, it's, a, it's an institution with a 130 year plus heritage that's going to be more powerful in the next century than it was in the last century. If I was thinking about what I, uh, a motif to surround my deanship, it would be built to last. I, I can't steal that because I think that's a, an American auto company, but, um, but that's, the, that's the way I think about it. Long game, built to last, because the, you know, the best thing that Wharton has an extraordinary heritage. The most important thing I think I and we can do to honour that heritage is to leverage it for the future. And as I said, make the next century better than the last century, which is a tall order because the last one was pretty good. Yeah, so, so a, couple of, a couple of responses to that question, which I think is an extremely important one. The first is that, um, you know, I, I think a Wharton education should have basically two, com two elements to it. Of course, we want to teach you, give you cutting edge technical and disciplinary skills. But we also need to have a matrix approach to that. Uh, for example, you know, always thinking about having leadership in the curriculum is critical. Thinking about giving you opportunities to intern in professional organizations, giving you international experiences. Things that don't fit into a disciplinary framework, I think, provide an essential second dimension to, to a Wharton education. Uh, the second thing I'd say there is that you know, when I walk into my office every day, I see a sign that says Wharton School of Finance and Commerce, the way the school was founded. But, but what I see and what I know is that while Wharton has an extraordinarily preeminent position in the world of finance, and, and, I, I, and I expect and I want to support that flourishing into the, into the long run future, Wharton's much more than a finance school. So if I look at what makes Wharton finance great, I think it's what makes Wharton great as a whole, which is it's a rigorous focus on data and on analytics. So I think that's going to be more important in a big data era than it's ever been before. So a division between leaders and, and analysts, I think that division is going to erode because better leaders are going to make better decisions and they're going to make better decisions because they have more facility with analyzing big data and Wharton can really, can really help, probably more than anyone else do that. So Wharton's more than a finance school, it's, a, it's an analytics-based institution. But the other thing, of course, is that we do an enormous amount of innovation and entrepreneurship here. Wharton in its DNA is a profoundly entrepreneurial place. The University of Pennsylvania is an externally oriented, uh, innovative place, and, and President Gutman has made it, I, I think, one of her highest priorities, appropriately so, for the for the remainder of her presidency. So the so the university is going to create uh, something called is going to launch something called the Penn Center for Innovation, which is going to focus on commercializing great IP that uh, that is on campus, particularly in biomed. What I'd like to do is to focus more on students and 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 really try to turbocharge the innovativeness that is in all of you these days. So, you know, I'm sure you'll go on and conquer the world and do amazing things, maybe create amazing things while you're here, but I think, I think where students are concerned, it's not necessarily the innovations you create while you're students that's going to matter, it's the innovative mindset that we can probably harness and turbocharge in all of you. So I'd like to focus on that. Yeah, it's so, that's so interesting, right? We, we've got these three words that tend to be conflated, innovation, entrepreneurship, and technology. But I don't think they necessarily need to be conflated. So when I look at uh, private equity hedge funds and the like, 
that's seriously financial entrepreneurship where Wharton and Wharton students and Wharton alums have been world leaders. So financial entrepreneurship can happen a long way from Silicon Valley. So that was the, that's the first thing I would say about it. But the, but the second one is that you know, a lot of students, and, I, and I've met a bunch of our fantastic student entrepreneurs, want to, want to think about what the best leverage point for a Wharton entrepreneur would be. And it might be in the area of analytics. So we've got a bunch of startups that students are working on that really are about big data and analytics. And, and the connections there to Silicon Valley are obviously extraordinarily strong. You know, you think about companies like Google, Facebook, LinkedIn. They are analytics companies. We might think of them as tech companies, but everything they do is about analytics. So I think there's a lot of synergy there. Well, I've talked about you know, the, the things that, that strike me as being the most important. Um, making real and making everyone understand that yes, Wharton's a fantastic finance school, but it's much more than that. Uh, and with a focus on analytics, with a focus on innovation and entrepreneurship, I think that's really important. Taking advantage in all senses of the online educational opportunity to provide uh, our, our, uh, our education at low or no cost, full access to people all around the world who can't come on campus, but at the same time ensuring that we, that we integrate technology into the on-campus experience to make it the highest value add we can. Those are really important to me. If I go a little macro for a second, you know, I, I think that we're living in this world in which an expanded role of the, of the private sector and a decreasing distance between private benefit and public good it is going to be a big feature of the world. That means that business education will become more relevant, not less relevant, and it means that the leadership position Wharton occupies is even more important. So it's a fantastic time for me to be here, and I couldn't be happier. I think this heritage and I think global reach. And as you said, uh, the Wharton name is, is a household name all around the world. We have very successful alumni in the four corners of the globe. When I'm on campus, I feel the heritage. And, and I, I think one thing that, again, my perspective having been in different universities makes clearer to me than might be clear to you, um, is the centrality of Wharton to the university. So Wharton is central to Penn's history. The two, the two institutions have grown up together. Second, Wharton is geographically central to the university in, in a way that I think is unlike any other business school. So Locust Walk is close to a unique part of American higher education. The fact that Wharton is sitting on both sides of Locust Walk gives us an incredible centrality. And then the third, the third thing I'd say about centrality of Wharton to the university is uh, our undergraduate student body. You know, the fact that about a quarter of Penn undergraduates at, are at Wharton not only distinguishes us from most other major business schools in the world, but also means that that integration between the business school and the rest of the university can be and should be stronger and more effective here than almost anywhere else. That's so interesting, you know, I'm smiling in, uh, in reflecting on that because, <clears throat> you know, there, there are jokes about English language countries, that there are two countries or more countries divided by a common language, and it, it, there's a lot of truth to that. So the cultural mindset in Australia is very different from the cultural mindset in the US. When I'm wearing an Australian hat, the first, the first move you make is always a self-deprecating one, put yourself down. Um, that's not the way the U.S. is, and now that I've been back here for a few months, I can give you a, a, a more positive spin on that. And the, the positive spin uh, from my background, I think, uh, my intellectual background, uh, has two components. The first one is that I've tried to understand and explain the world to Americans when I was in the U.S., and when I was in Australia, I was trying to explain America to Asia and to Australia. So I think that, that that's a plus. The second thing is, as I said, I have a very much a macro perspective, which, which I think allows me to see the role of business and the expanding role of business quite clearly, which is a great complement to a more traditional business school move, which is to focus on 
uh, how can an individual firm uh, perform better than its competitors? So, so I hope that uh, I hope and believe that there are a lot of complementarities. And the longer I'm here, I, I, I not only do I feel a little bit less unusual, but I hope uh, I hope everyone who interacts with me will feel that as well. Thanks a lot. I really appreciate you taking. My the pleasure. Time. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much.